I really appreciate that. And for you all taking time out on the Sunday afternoon uh, to unite with me. Of course, you know, I'm here in Memphis, Tennessee. My name is Ron Brooks. Uh, I go by Champ. Uh, so many know me as Champ Ron. And we're going to go through kind of you know, today real estate investing in 2021. Okay, so we know that uh, 2020 has been what it's been. Okay, and it is coming to an end. Uh, for some, that is uh, uh, a thought of joy. For some, maybe not so much, but either way, um, time is moving ahead and we are shortly coming up on 2021. What we wanna go through today uh, specifically is, you know, what I have done uh, as well as those that work with me uh, around real estate investing. So if you're fairly new to investing or if you've been a, a seasoned investor, um, this will definitely be for you. Um, for those that are familiar with me and maybe have followed me for some time, you know that um, you know, I'm a pretty direct guy. I, I don't like to engage in a lot of foolishness or gimmicks or, or BS. Um, I just come straight from the heart. And what I want to accomplish today is give you some food for thought on how you can get involved or maybe even escalate uh, your uh, real estate investing uh, going into next year. Um, one of the things we know about next year is that, um, you know, if, if you sit and wait for uh, the government to come lay things in your lap, or if you sit and wait on the vaccine to make everything magically go away, uh, I'm telling you that uh, next year is going to be tough for you if that's what your, your strategy is. And so whatever it is that you choose to do, as we talk about it today, um, you know, do it with passion and uh, do it with purpose. Okay. Um, can everybody give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can see um, the, the presentation? Should say real estate investing in 2021. Uh, if you can see that, um, just uh, let me know in the chat. All right, we got some thumbs up. Thank you, Pearl. Thank you, Denisha. Thank you, Jocelyn. Excellent. My brother Marvin, thank you so much, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ms. Hayes, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. All right, Derek, thank you so much, man. Main man Derek right there. Nico, thank you so much. And now let me know where you guys are from, also in the chat, uh, if you would. Um, if, I think you know, there's a number of you that are from Memphis um, or from surrounding areas. Maybe you're, you're from different parts of the country, um, but definitely let me know where you're from. Represent where you at. Claim you'll sit. Rep you'll sit. Well, we got Memphis. We got Olive Branch. We got uh, Keelan, Texas. We got Tampa. We got Chicago. We got Madison, Mississippi. What's up? What's up? What y'all doing on the Sunday? Y'all want to learn about some real estate? Y'all don't want to watch the NFL? Y'all tired of watching other folk make money, huh? <laughs> Sherika, what's going on? Tab, what's going on? I got Atlanta, I got Memphis. Um, what's up? What's up? What's up? Olive Branch. Yeah, y'all from all over the place, man. What's up? What's up with y'all? I appreciate y'all coming in and showing love. So thank you so much. Um, let's let's kind of get into, you know, kind of what we want to get into today. Um, so kind of five areas that we're going to get into um, at, at a fairly high level, which is first, the mindset of investing, um, to the banking of investing, uh, and this is all as it relates to real estate. Um, three, the strategies of investing. Um, four, what's going to be next in 2021. And then at the end, we'll do you know, some Q&A, okay? Um, we want to be as interactive as possible, so definitely use the chat. Um, if you want to unmute yourself, um, definitely feel free to do that. If you want to jump in, if you've got a question, you got a statement, you got a comment, uh, feel free to do that uh, also as well. And then we're going to have a special guest that's going to join us here in just a little bit that I'm actually going to call on the phone directly. And um, he's going to share some background and, and how he and I work together. He's actually up in Canada. So uh, my good brother, that's going to join us here shortly. But so that's kind of setting the stage and kind of setting the room uh, for today. All right. So um, for those that uh, maybe you've been following me for some time or, or maybe you haven't, maybe I'm new to you. 
Uh, my name is Ron Brooks Jr. Uh, that's Junior, yes, my dad is uh, here. So if you call me Mr. Brooks, I'm gonna be looking for him because uh, he's Mr. Brooks, not me yet. Um, but yes, I am an, an investor. I host a podcast. Uh, some of you, I, I see some of my listeners, but uh, if you haven't heard of it, uh, the Minding Your Business podcast I've been doing for now three and a half years. And I've uh, interviewed uh, many business owners and entrepreneurs and people across many different creative spaces now for three and a half years. And that's well over now 235 uh, episodes of that podcast. Um, some of you know me from my banking uh, career. So I was a, a banker for 17 years. I started um, actually back in the early 2000s uh, while I was in college. I started the entry level, went through the management training program, and then kind of off I went, um, kind of wrapping up in the C-suite over at Orion Federal Credit Union uh, back in 2018. Uh, so now I'm an advocate for equity in banking in low to moderate income communities. So um, it's equity, not necessarily equality, but equity. And we'll talk a little bit more about the difference between the two um, as we go forward. Uh, I'm a University of Memphis grad. Uh, that's where I met my wife and uh, her and I have been together uh, now uh, well over 13 years. Our 14 year anniversary is next summer. And I've got three uh, daughters uh, that are in elementary school, fifth, fourth, and second grade. Uh, I was a one-year athlete at the University of Memphis. So I played basketball there. Um, and yeah, also did some grad school work over at the University of Memphis. And then I've been a real estate investor, uh, kind of concurrent with my banking career since 2007. And then I'm the author of Legacy Living, which you can find um, on Amazon or wherever you get your, uh, your books. Um, you can find uh, Legacy Living uh, out there. So definitely pick that up. I wrote that uh, back in 2015, okay? So that's a little bit about me. Um, I wanna bring in my partner who's gonna join me. I'm actually gonna call him. He's up in Canada in, in the Cambridge area. And um, yeah, this brother, his name is Cedric Daly. Um, and he, you're gonna learn a lot from him today along with myself. Um, because he brings a wealth of knowledge and kind of a very unique background to the game. Um, and so I'm actually calling him up now and he's gonna join us. Hey Ron, how you doing bro? Cedric, what's up man, how you doing? <laughs> Dig that, man. I've got you live here on the uh, Real Estate Investing in 2021 uh, webinar, man. We've got several folks on um, from all over, um, you know, here in the United States, brother. So um, say hello to everybody. Hey, guys. How you guys doing? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, man, I, I appreciate you jumping on, man. Um, you know, I just kind of introduced you kind of briefly, man. You're, uh, you know, obviously you do some wholesaling. You're an investor there in the Cambridge area. Um, you have a you know multi-million dollar portfolio uh, that you manage there. You're you're the you know part owner of a brokerage. Um, you're a former executive at BlackBerry, man. But yeah, you know, aside from all that, man, share us with us a little bit about yourself and um, kind of you know you know your background leading up into real estate. No, I appreciate it, Ron. It's an honor. And you're a dear friend of mine, and uh, I'm always I'm always here to help. And, uh, Anytime I can actually spread the knowledge with me, I'm always open to that. So, um, you know, again, it's an honor to be on here. So, I appreciate you uh, thinking of me. So, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. Um, you know, I'm 39, and um, I always tell this around, you know, when we talk, we, we talk daily, we sometimes three, four times a day. Um, but um, one of the things I've always said is, you know, when I started in the, in the real estate business when I was 25, Right, so I started in 2005 and actually when I bought my first property, I'm 39 right now. Um, you know, I didn't know much about real estate. I just knew my dad, uh, being an immigrant, he came from uh, a small island. I'm not sure everybody knows the island. It's called Dominica, it's a small island in the Caribbean. My my parents emigrated from um, they, from there to Canada back in 1972. And, um, you know, one of the things my dad, my dad, you know, a big investor, um, he doesn't like risk, but he, he, he bought his first property. And I remember as a kid, um, you know, we bought another property and I asked my dad, how does this all work? And he said, well, you know, we have a home, we rent, they rent it out, they pay us rents, 
and I can use that money to buy more property. So as a kid, I think I was five, six years old, that was a had that aha moment like, wow. So you mean you're buying a property that somebody else is gonna rent and you're gonna get and you're gonna get cash from that to buy it to use it for other things? And yeah. So that really stuck in my mind when I was a kid and I said first thing I, I set a goal and, and First thing I said is, you know, when I'm 25, early, early 20s, I want to buy my first property. So I saved up at that time. I got a lot of things, $30,000 when I saved up. Bought my first property as a townhouse. Found a townhouse right by the University of Waterloo. Um, I paid $107,000 for that property. You guys will laugh now. That property is worth close to $500,000 now. It's not <laughs> But anyway, um, that's where it first started my teeth in the real estate. And at that time, I was getting rents at that point, about $1,000 a month of rent. Um, which is right around the one percent rule, which I'm sure Ron talks a lot about, but that was my strategy one percent rule in all my rental properties. So when I bought that in 2005, I didn't know where I was going, right? I just knew that hey, the real estate is a good thing, my dad made money from it, he's been successful, um, and there's an opportunity for me to make some money from this. Um, mind you, at that time, I started working at RIM, uh, now known as Blackberry, um, and that was my full time job. And you know, again, it was real estate was just a pastime for me. Time goes on, I bought my second property, okay? and uh, that property now was um, was also Waterloo, and uh, and the beauty of real estate was I was able to actually um, uh, refinance that first property, and that refinance allowed me to have the down payment to buy my second property, while also keeping my first property, so it was a win-win for me. Um, and I bought that property, that was, you know, 150 k is what I paid for that. Again, that property now is worth over over 450 grand now so when i bought that property and then i started seeing that wow this is this could become a way of life here because when i bought that property a lot of my friends um we all worked at blackberry um, they said hey you know we'll, we'll rent it from you we'll rent a room for you so that time was a bachelor you know i was single and I said okay great so now i got a, a cash flow rent rental property in waterloo then i got a second property which i live in and then i have my friend paying me rent every month so, you know, it, it was a great situation. Um, so time goes by now. Uh, fast forward a bit. I realized that, you know, there's uncertainty with Blackberry. You know, let me do that in the news. There's uncertainty there. Um, so I needed to be a little bit closer to home. And home to me was Cambridge. So bought my, bought my third place now in Cambridge. Um, and I paid two ninety for it. And let you know, right now, as of today, it's worth over $550,000. Okay? Mm. And... So at that point, I bought, yeah, so you can, you can see, getting into real estate, if you're already going into real estate for a long-term strategy, you're always going to win down the road, right? And this is, so when I got that place in Cambridge, um, that opened up a lot of doors for me because now I had the two in Waterloo and then I had the one in Cambridge. Now here's where it really gets me, where my career kind of took a, a little shift. Um, I had a, real, uh, a realtor come to me and said, um, you know, I know you're an investor, you're buying some properties and you're young. Um, even thought of the RTO, they call that up in Canada, they call that the rental. In the States, you probably hear it called seller financing. Um, or or um, there's different options for but rent to own is what it was called. And so basically, um, what, what I did is he brought me a package. And here's the beauty of it. He brought me a package in Woodstock. Woodstock's about two hours east of Detroit, it would take. And it was uh, an opportunity to own a property okay, that somebody was with bad credit that they weren't able to get approved for a mortgage. So what they needed is, you know, they didn't want they didn't want to rent anymore. So they wanted an opportunity to own, but but build up their credit within a small period of time. So essentially, what it was, he put together a package deal. Cedric, here's a, here's the property. It's um it's a teacher, and I guess his wife was um uh, she was a professor. But both of them went bankrupt at one point, so they weren't able to get approved for mortgage. So what they wanted was, you now will own this property. You'll buy mm -hmm. it. At this purchase price, two years after um, the purchase price will be obviously with inflation will go up the purchase price, and you don't have to worry about a thing. It's 24 months of, of checks, uh, direct deposit into your account. They live in it like it's their own. I don't have to worry about repairs. I don't have to worry about any anything. But basically, I'm the owner. I pay the insurance. I pay the property tax, and I pay the mortgage. That's it. So it was a win-win for me. So um, my dad and I actually went 50/50 in it. We invested into it. Let me tell you guys, it was the best, easiest $50,000 I ever made in my life, okay? And so I'm not saying this to brag. This is just, I'm saying this because it, it opened me up to opportunities that I probably wouldn't have been, you know, would have been interested in mm -hmm. unless it came to me. 
So that was the first one. And then I did a second rent to own in Kitchener, Waterloo, similar thing. Um, and at that point, I started saying, well, this is a way of life. I could, if I really, I did, did the reverse engineering here. If I, go, if I just really just start building up my portfolio now, and I'm, I'm more of a buy and hold guy, but this, these two options were too great for me to pass up. But so my, my strategy shifted to say, I'm going to continue building up my portfolio so mm-hmm. that way I can eventually retire from my job and do this full time. So I have a passion for it. So long story short now, where, where, the next, where the next segment came in was I ended up buying another property. Um, now, this other property is actually a, a fourplex in Listowel. You probably will never, nobody probably knows where Listowel is on this, on this call, but if you, if you Google it up, it's actually a small town uh, a little north and west of Waterloo, Ontario. Waterloo, Ontario is the head office of Blackberry. Grant. But okay. uh, Listowel is the, the booming market. Okay? Bought the property there, the fourplex. So, you know, make a long story short, now my portfolio consists of 11, uh, 11 doors. And um, it really just started with, you know, that, that first conversation with my dad. And here we are now, we're on wholesaling, as we're on set. And, uh, and, and one of the things I did there is I, I looked at an opportunity where I can build up cash flow to continue reinvesting back into real estate, right? Um, and, and then on the brokerage, another opportunity came my way from a realtor who said, you know, instead of being your investor, uh, like they do business, I uh, want to partner with you on, a, on an opportunity to own an exit realty uh, brokerage. Uh, and I said, you know, obviously it took months to actually do my due diligence and up pulling the trigger and then making it happen um, actually earlier this month. So now I own uh, 10% of the exit realty, which is uh, well, a small number, but at the end of the day, it's my, it's my foot in the door. Um, and here we are now, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're wholesaling. I got the brokerage, and then of course I still have my buying mold where I'm still looking to continue buying properties. That's yeah. a little, a little bit about me from a real estate perspective. I'll pass yeah. To Ron. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Cedric. I appreciate that. And, and you touched on a lot of different areas that we want to go through uh, definitely today. Um, as we talk through, you know, our different subject matter here as it relates to real estate investing. So, um, and, and I'll have you chime in here again, Cedric, here in just a minute. But what I want to go through yeah. is you know, before you start doing anything, so before you invest, you know, quote unquote, into anything, whether it's um, you have a passion for nonprofit and helping people that way, you have a passion for e-commerce, uh, whatever your your business model is and whatever endeavor that you want to set out and do, you want to first understand your mindset around it. So um, this before you get into any of the technical terms, before you start getting into, you know, quote unquote, the bag and all that type of stuff, um, you first want to get into, you know, what's your motivation? What, you know, why, you know, what's your why? As you may have heard that sometimes in corporate speak, but, you know, what, what is it that's motivating you to want to get into real estate investing? So if you're in the chat, uh, share with me real quick, what is your motivation? Why do you want to, if you're not in real estate investing, why do you want to get in? Or if you are in real estate investing, or if you're, you know, a, a licensed uh, realtor, you know, what, what motivated you to get into real estate? So share that with me in the comments, if you would. Let's see, I got some people hit me up privately. Okay, so, so some of you is to make money, okay? That makes sense, you wanna be able to help people. You want to be able to I retire? On my line? What's that, Cedric? Can I chime in on my line? Please. While you're waiting? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so my why is, you know, I got two kids, um, fiance, and for me, it's really just creating generational wealth for them, right? Every and I think Ron is very similar with his three daughters, right? We want to, we want to create, uh, you know, where we, where our kids never have to worry about money. And, and that's my why. My motivation is my kids to make sure they're set up for success. They want to have go to university, they want to have their master's. That's not a problem. That's that's the goal for me. And that's my why. That's what keeps me motivated every single day. Yeah, absolutely. And so, Cedric, as you mentioned that, and other people are mentioning things, um, you know, similar. They're talking about, uh, you know, helping their children. They're talking about ownership. They're talking about uh, being able to retire, generational wealth. Um, and so I, I'm seeing all that. Um, and those are great you know, motivators, right? 
And so when you start anything, that's where you first start. Before you start doing it, before you go build a website, before you run, you know, doing this and doing that, the first thing you have to start is what's your motivation? You know, my motivation is um, similar to what many of you have said, it's to, um, to transform um, the, uh, the generational wealth that ultimately gets passed down. That's more of my long-term strategy. In the immediate, my motivation is um, my daughters are, my oldest daughter will be 11 in February. So, you know, as those of you that have children and, and now maybe have grown children, um, you know, you can remember this, you know, this time and it goes by quick, right? That's what I think all of us can agree that your children and everybody, they grow up quick. And, you know, there was a time when I was holding everybody and, and changing diapers and you know, doing all that stuff, feeding people. Now I got folks that are hitting their double digit years here very soon. Um, my oldest daughter's already there. And so then what happens is, you know, I'm start looking to the teenage years and when they're eventually gonna be driving and then eventually, um, you know, move out of my house as a, an adult and doing their own thing. And so, you know, that time is shorter than it was right when they were born. And so that's where, uh, my motivating factor is, as well as, you know, for my wife and I to be able to continue to do some things. You know, right now we're, we're paying down debt and we're doing a great job with that. And, you know, we're, we're be able to stack money to have a goal. And so you always give your money a goal. You partner with your money. You know, it doesn't just exist. You partner with it. And so that's what we use our different exit strategies that we'll talk about here shortly um, in real estate. So that's your motivation. Um, you wanna focus on your value uh, over time spent. Uh, Cedric mentioned that you know, he and I spend a lot of time you know, kind of talking through deals and um, working with buyers, working with sellers. Um, you know, what we always try to do is focus on what value do we add to them? So you notice know even in Cedric's story and, and what I'm sharing y'all, that there was nothing about just solely making money just for the sake of just having money, right? when you focus on the value. So what's the value in, in investing? Um, you're solving problems, right? You're solving problems for other people. The more problems you solve for other people, and I, I always forget who says the quote, but you know, the, the more you help other people get what they want, the more you'll get what you want, right? And so you wanna spend time focusing on the, the value. What's the value that you add? In, and in this case, in real estate, What's the value that you offer a seller? What's the value that you offer a buyer, right? And everyone that you work with. So, you know, keep your, your, your pins on that because we're gonna dive into that even more. Um, it, one of my favorites is plans are only worth the, the action that they create, okay? So going back to your, even with your motivation, what I see a lot of people do is they're, they're constantly in the plan mode. They're always analyzing things and they use that as an excuse to not take action, right? And I've been there before. Um, so when you're planning, so if you're planning to get into investing, let's just say you're starting out or if you want to become a real estate agent or whatever it is that you want to do, um, and all those are tremendous, um, you know, you can, there's only so much planning you're going to be able to do. Yeah, someone hit me with the Zig Ziglar quote, quote. Thanks, Kim. I appreciate it. Um, I always forget the, you know, all those different quotes, but um, yeah, so you're, you don't want to spend so much time planning, right? You know, constantly signing up for people's courses, you know, spending money with all these gurus on YouTube and, you know, all these different things, buying up classes. You know, that's one thing that I don't do. And you notice y'all all came on here for free. You know, I'm giving game away for free as I know it, right? And if I don't know it, I'll tell you that I don't know, it, or if I haven't done it, but don't spend so much time doing that and always being in class. At some point, you got to go execute, okay? And so um, one of the things that um, Cedric and I always talk about is, you know, how we take action and what we do to take action, all right? Your network is an asset, okay? As you're connecting with people here, even on this webinar, um, you know, you should be reaching out. Um, some of these folks you may already know through social media and that sort of thing, but one of the things about uh, real estate is relationship based. Um, and the better that you can foster and grow those relationships through trust, transparency, and confidence. That's it. Trust, transparency, and confidence. If you, you embody those things in your relationships, um, you will build a, a network that um, is bi-directional, your assets to each other. 
okay? And then you have to visualize your success in real estate. Um, something else that it goes along with, you know, kind of planning and that sort of thing is you have to visualize success. So when you start out, um, one of the things that I try to do is think about it like, you know, a lot of y'all like Netflix and y'all like movies and the latest shows and that sort of thing. Think of your life and going into investing like a movie. Picture it as a movie and you're doing everything that you're setting out to do is successful, right? Because in, in your mindset, and I hear this from people all the time when they want to get started in, in investing, is they start running down the laundry list of things that could go wrong, right? Well, Ron, what if I lose money? Well, Ron, what if the market goes bad? Well, Ron, what if aliens come down and, you know, do something to us? Ron, what if they don't have the vaccine? Ron, what if uh, Donald Trump doesn't get out of office? Ron, what if, you know, and, and I get worn out with the what ifs all day, right? Okay, so instead of train your mind to think through, you know, what will work and what can work versus what doesn't work or, um, you know, all the different, you know, uh, ways that something can, can go bad. Sure, things can go bad. That's why it's called investing. Right. You take risks. That's what entrepreneurship is. You know, if you don't want to take risks, then this isn't the space to be. In, right. But what we're going to talk about is ways to, you know, either eliminate that or greatly mitigate it. But investing is about taking risks. Right. You invest can I, everything. Can I, can I find in on one piece? Yeah, please do. Yeah. So, you know, like Wayne Gretzky said, you know, you miss 100 percent of the shots you don't take. Right. Facts. So Ron is saying, you know, you, 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 you've got to take. I'm not saying take a major risk, but you take calculated risks, right? And right. real estate, and I'm going to say this again, if, if, if you're in for the long, like there's a lot of flippers, there's a lot of buy and holds, but if you're in the long term with real estate, at nine times of the time, you're going to be, you're going to be successful. It's not, not a guarantee, but it, it's a good, it's a, you're always going to have renters, you know? So that's kind of what Ron is saying. You take some chances when it comes to real estate, but calculated chances. Facts. Yep. Absolutely. No, thanks, Cedric. I appreciate that. Um, one of the things I want to get into um, after, you know, we've set our mindset, so all minds are clear there. Um, I want to talk about the, the banking of investing. Okay. Um, and as we go through this, again, if you, you know, use the chat function or, or whatever, if you've got questions or, or anything for me or Cedric or anybody else to, to answer, and we'll jump on those uh, as quickly as we can. Um, but I want to talk from a high level at the banking uh, around investing. And so, you know, I've got expertise here. I did uh, throughout my 17 year career, I did all kinds of different deals um, from just your basic, um, you know, financing deal of, of term loans and lines of credit um, to derivative deals um, where they're tied into uh, a, a LIBOR uh, interest rates and all those type of things, mortgage financing. Um, I, you know, part of my career I spent, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the credit union space. So I've kind of spanned uh, the entire globe with uh, various forms of financing. But um, as you're, many of you may or may not be aware of, um, of course, you have your bank, your credit union, your mortgage, uh, you know, financing options. Those are fairly traditional. Um, you know, uh, on the retail kind of consumer side, they're going to be looking at your, your credit profile. They're looking at um, your debt to income, you know, and, you know, you know, those sort of things and, and calculating, you know, what your risk is for receiving that financing. So pretty basic. You all are, are very familiar with that. Um, you know, one area that I tend to work a lot in is the private uh, money loans or with private lenders. The difference is, is that a private lender doesn't have, you know, if you compare them, say, to Bank of America, they don't have a branch on every corner, right? They don't have near the level of um, expense in, in their kind of frontline and, and back office staffs. So they exist solely just to lend, whereas your bank does, you know, a hundred different things the Sunday, right? They're wiring money, they're lending, they're taking in deposits, they're, they're selling safe deposit boxes, they're doing commercial loans, you know, you, know, you name it, they're doing it. Um, your private money lenders, um, which many of them have popped up, um, you, you'll think of some of the fintechs and that sort of thing. They're involved in you know, investing pretty heavy. And uh, Cedric and I work with several of the private lenders around the country uh, to be able to finance deals. Um, private lenders you know, tend to have a little bit better terms than your bank, and they tend to work a little more expeditiously uh, than 
your bank or your credit union or even your mortgage company. Um, but they provide a great value in the marketplace and definitely a, a route that you should look at. Um, home equity loans and lines of credit um, are a great way to get started in investing. So if you own property already, whether it's your, your, uh, your the home that you occupy uh, or other property that you may already own, uh, using home equity loans and lines of credit are, are a great uh, uh, route to go. One, uh, the application process tends to be, again, a little bit quicker, even if you are dealing with a bank or credit union. Um, you know, two, and you check with, of course, I'm not a, uh, a tax professional, but check with your tax professional because there are uh, opportunities to still deduct the interest uh, from your uh, taxable income on your tax return. So definitely check with your tax professional there uh, for that opportunity. But it's a great way to get uh, you know, funding fairly quickly if you have the equity available in your home or, and or other homes that you may own. Um, hard money lending. So many, there are many individuals all around. Uh, Cedric and I work with some, some really good ones that we can share, uh, but hard money loans uh, are very quick and hard money lenders look at almost solely the asset, right? So the asset, the actual property, what's the value of the property? So they're more interested in that than your credit profile and, and you know, debt to income, that sort of thing. So they're, they're a little bit more interested in the actual deal, all right? Many investors use hard money loans as short-term kind of bridges uh, to actually um, purchase a, a property and maybe even rehab it uh, before taking out that loan, uh, certainly with a, um, you know, a more long-term solution like a private uh, loan, uh, maybe a home equity or uh, traditional financing from a bank, uh, credit union, or mortgage company. A hard money loan is not a long-term solution, okay? So you don't get a hard money loan um, no different than a line of credit. A line of credit is not a long-term solution to buy an asset, okay? Because you want principal and interest payments, you want to actually be able to pay it off. Unless you got a short-term flip, which we'll talk about, um, you really don't want to use you know, hard money or lines of credit for anything long term. And many of your, your hard money lenders won't go uh, much past, you know, sometimes a year at the most. But uh, there are some various terms, but most of the time they're short term. Uh, commercial lending. So if you're purchasing, um, you know, commercial property um, and whatever form that that is, um, your commercial loan term or line of credit are going to come into play. Uh, on commercial lending, the way it differs from um, kind of consumer lending is that they're not interested in debt to income. So they're not looking at kind of primarily at how you uh, conduct your bills on a monthly basis. They use what's called uh, debt service coverage or, or DSC. Uh, debt service coverage is basically a calculation and, and I'll give it to, I'll, versus going into the math, y'all, I'm gonna go into what it means in English, okay? So debt service coverage is an annual calculation, all right? It looks at the debts of whatever entity or entities that are involved as well as you personally and comes to, if you're personally guaranteeing the loan, um, and I'll talk about that in a second, but um, debt service coverage is an annual calculation that is, is similar to DTI, um, but it's taking your annual debts against your annual income. And in plain English, it's essentially saying that for every dollar of uh, debt that you have, the, how much money do you have to cover that debt? So many banks you know, typically will want a debt service coverage uh, as a ratio of 1.25 at a minimum. What that means is for every dollar of debt, you have at least a dollar and 25 cents to cover that debt. And particularly the debt that you're taking out with the uh, commercial lender. So they want to make sure that you have more than enough uh, to cover and pay them back with interest. Okay, does that make sense? So that's what your commercial. So think about your commercial lenders looking at things different than say your mortgage company. Okay, um, they're going to be you know you're more concerned on what that annual um, income looks like. Okay. Uh, Cedric mentioned earlier about owner and seller financing, and this is a tremendous way to, to get started. Um, and when you're maybe not in position to go to the banks or the credit unions or the mortgage company or to the commercial lender, or maybe even to the private lender, um, 
if you don't have a lot of money to put down, uh, or if maybe your credit profile is, is more challenged at the time, um, owner or seller financing is a great route for you to go. Um, Cedric, share with us, I, I know you've done a good bit of seller financing, man. Um, can you share with us just kind of at a high level, um, kind of quickly, you know, owner and seller financing? Yeah, yeah, yes, but certainly, Mark. So, um, seller financing, how it and, and how it works, guys, is uh, I'll give you an example. We'll just use a property, um, say, property for 100K. Okay. Um, so, $100,000, say I only have, you know, I only have $10,000 to my name, or say $5,000 to my name. Um, what you typically would do is you would go to a lender, right? So, I'd go to, you know, at my point, I go to credit unions a lot now. The max up in terms of uh, a lender. So I go to a credit union and say, well, I want this property. They say, well, we'll only be able to give you 75% loan to value. So that means they're only going to give me $75,000. If I only have $5,000, I'm still going to delta 20K, all right, that I need to get. How am I going to get that $20,000 to put my down payment? So that's where the seller financing is very intriguing. Because now you go to the seller, and if that seller is motivated enough to sell it, right? You say to them, well, if you can leave 20K, right, um, and we'll do a two-year term, right, for, for 20K, um, you know, obviously do your math. And try, I try to negotiate 0% interest. But most times, most savvy investors, if they're savvy, they're going to want at least 5, 5%. But still, when you crush numbers, you now are still going to have a property where you only put five grand down, okay? Seller is leaving 20K in. Your lender is giving you seventy-five thousand, and then you're gonna, in this case, you're gonna rent it out, hopefully for you know a thousand a month in rent. Numbers work out. Of this, where I share with Ron, I talk a lot about with the calculator. Very important that you run your numbers through a calculator. You always want to make sure your cash flow. If your cash flows, it's a win-win for everybody. Seller wins because they get the home sold. Mind you, they're they're gonna leave twenty k into it. Um, uh, you win because you get the property. And the, and the lender wins because now they, you know, they're making money by lending you the 75 grand. And I just use that easy for easy math, 100 K that can work on, you know, various numbers, but that's essentially seller financing in a nutshell. And it's very powerful. I've used it several times up in Canada. We call it a vendor take back. So a B2B, very similar. Um, but it's a very easy way to structure a deal where you don't have, where you, where you don't put your own money or much of your own money in. Yeah, absolutely. And there's also, you know, the opportunity with owner or seller financing, um, not just to even get the down payment, but even to finance the entire deal. And so what you're seeing right now and, and some of the deals that I've been able to work um, is uh, tired landlords. Right. And so when you say tired landlords, these are folks, you know, and, and 2020 has exacerbated this, but, um, you know, dealing with, the, you know, the pandemic and, and that sort of thing combined with um, having owned properties for some time, combined with dealing with um, the day-to-day -day management that's required of properties and tenants and um, rehab and you know uh, fix-ups and that sort of thing. Um, there's a growing population of men and women that are ready to kind of get out of the game, so to speak. And so um, deals I've been able to work, it, Cedric, you're aware of this, a uh, deal I closed last week uh, was on a 16 property portfolio. Um, that was from a, a landlord that you know was just tired, was ready to get out of the game, kind of cash out, and uh, he and his wife go do something else. So remember the motivation, right? And I'll talk about this some more in just a minute. That was his motivation. I was able to connect him. So I wholesaled the deal. Um, I was able to get it under contract for 455,000. This was 16 properties, 16 residential properties here in Memphis. Um, some were occupied. Um, as a matter of fact, 11 of them were occupied and five of them were vacant, all right? So this portfolio of 16 properties, I got under contract for 455,000, had a local Memphis buyer buy it for 500,000, okay? So under contract for 455,000, uh, sold to a buyer, a cash buyer for 500,000. So you, you can do that math pretty easy on uh, where I came out in terms of uh, an assignment fee. And we'll talk about wholesaling as, one exit strategy here shortly, but um, Cedric and I are actually working on a deal that's closing this week um, that is going to yield us each uh, $19,000. Um, and this is on a property that's uh, here in the Memphis area uh, that he and I were able to partner on. And we're gonna get into this here shortly. 
um, about working together, but Cedric and I work extremely well together. And from working together, we're able to solve problems for buyers and sellers and then get paid for doing so. And that's really kind of the name of the game. Okay, so let's talk some about some of the strategies or exit strategies of, of real estate. Um, and this is whether you're, you're an investor and or uh, if you're an investor that's also licensed. So if you have um, a, a real estate license, you know, this still, you know, can apply as well, although there's some, some different ways that you have to kind of handle um, how you go about it uh, if you happen to be uh, a licensed uh, real estate agent. Um, first, and, and Cedric has spoke to this, um, kind of a buy and hold strategy. This is for uh, those that have a long-term kind of play in real estate, okay? You're looking to earn rental income. So you purchase a property. Um, you typically will fix that up if it requires any kind of rehab. And then you'll rent it out to a tenant, okay? And then you'll earn the, the monthly income for however long you'll do that until you, you know, uh, sell the property or do something with the property and change its ownership. But um, we work, you know, we being Cedric and myself and, and others that are on the team, um, we work with buyers, cash buyers, who that is their exit strategy. Their strategy is fairly simple. They wanna buy um, at a certain you know, percentage of value, uh, which is uh, referred to as uh, ARV or after repair value. They wanna buy at a certain percentage of that value uh, we'll talk some more about that here shortly. And then they want to earn rental income. Others, they want to look more to fix and flip. So they want a, a slightly more short-term strategy that allows them to uh, purchase a property, um, fix it up with the idea that then they're going to flip it and sell it to another investor. Okay. And they're going to make money on the back end doing that. Okay. Um, there are many buyers, cash buyers, who prefer that strategy as well. They're not necessarily looking, um, you know, at anything other than, like, say, straight value. So they're not really concerned about what the property is going to rent for or that sort of thing, because it's not nearly as long-term of a strategy as buy and hold, as far as on the individual property. So when you fix and flip, you're going to purchase, you're going to get whatever funding that you have, you're going to purchase the property, fix it up, you know, rehab it, and then flip it. There are certain areas, you know, so if we're um, thinking from a, a Memphis standpoint, there are certain areas of Memphis that are going to be a little bit buy, better buy and hold areas than fix and flips, okay? Um, buy and hold is going to do well in an in area of any city that, uh, yeah, has more renters than owner occupants, than people who buy their home to live in it themselves, right? So if you're here in Memphis, you know, some of the areas that we do a lot of buy and hold in is um, you know, kind of just outside of downtown, kind of 38106, you know, 38107, you know, just talking through some of the zip codes. Those, the, those of you that are outside of Memphis may not, uh, you know, register with these zip codes as much, but, you know, 38108, um, 38114, and, and you, you guys know the drill. There are certain zip codes where you're going to find um, the values are going to be set up um, and the opportunity from a rent standpoint uh, is going to be very affordable for most people uh, to, to handle from a monthly standpoint. So buy and hold becomes a really good strategy. Um, fix and flip tends to come a little bit better. You can do it anywhere, but fix and flips are going to come into play a little more in areas where you've got um, a, a mixture of some renters and then some owner occupants. So that would be, you know, Hickory Hill is a big one, Fox Meadows, um, you know, the Southwind area, 38125 is a hot one right now, Raleigh, 38128, um, 38111, uh, especially south of Poplar, right? Um, those are going to be areas that are going to be really good uh, fix and flips because the values are going to be a little bit higher to where. You know, those are properties in some cases that, you know, once the rent gets north of, you know, eleven, twelve hundred dollars in some cases a month, um, they become a little bit more of a fix and flip as long as you have the values there. And so we'll talk more about uh, some of that here shortly. Um, hey, Juan, if you don't mind, no. a little bit of the, the, the first strategy kind of ties into the fix and flip as well, where the um, Burr is an acronym basically for the B is by. The uh, R, the first R, is to rehab it, so you're going to renovate it. Um, second R is to, uh, you're going to find a renter after you rehab it, because you're going to put a renter in there, because it makes it that much more uh, and 
advantageous for, for the bank to actually, you know, give you, one, give you some money for it. So second R is rented out. The third R is uh, refinance. Right. Because you force up the appreciation, you're going to refinance it, and then you're going to repeat it. Right. Right? And that's what a lot of investors do, the first strategy. Yeah. Smart move. Yeah, no, absolutely. Go through that real quick uh, again, Cedric, for everybody so that yeah. they're aware. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, so, the, so the first strategy is a strategy that a lot of investors use, right? So fix and flip is basically, so if you look at fix and flip, it's somebody that buys a property, you know, within a month, they rehab it and they sell it right away, okay? Where the first strategy is different in the sense that you buy the property, um, but where you buy it, you renovate it, right? So that's the first R. The second R is you find a renter, you put that renter in that property. And why that's very important is because when you go to a bank and you say, well, here, I bought a home for 50 grand and put 20 grand into it. So now, you know, 70 grand, but now force of appreciation is worth a hundred thousand dollars. And, and on top of that, look, I'm getting a thousand dollars a month in rent. The banks are looking, they love that. So now um, that, that bank will, most banks will give you about 80% loan to value. It's some a little more, some a little less, but now you, you, you're able to refinance it at the new pre, uh, appraised value, pull out the equity, keep that renter in there, and then repeat it and do the exact same thing. So you take that money that you got from the refinance and you now you buy another property, do the first strategy again. B for buy it, R for um, rehabbing it. Second R is renting out. Third R is to refinance it. And then the fourth R is repeat. Yeah, there you go. And like I said, that is another form of, you know, kind of a, a buy and hold and fix and flip. It's kind of a hybrid strategy. But yeah, what Cedric said is very true. Many investors do utilize that strategy. Um, you know, whether a single family or with, you know, uh, apartment complex or multifamily or even apartment units, um, you know, investors will utilize that strategy. Um, we talked some about seller financing. Um, so I don't think we got to cover that too much more. Um, I think we kind of talked through the premise of that. Um, bank owned homes or REOs, that's something else that, um, you know, I work with, of course, you know, I've got a little bit of inside track with that. Uh, so I got, I'm a bit of a cheat code with that having come from banking, but um, you, you, they're referred to as, as REOs. Um, and those are bank on homes. So those are homes that the bank um, has foreclosed on. And now they're part of their, um, in many cases, non-performing assets, right? So that's critical because, you know, you often hear at the top level, well, the bank's not in the, the business of, you um, you know, managing property. And that's true. That is true. But you, you hear that, you, you got to go a little bit deeper than that. It's not that they're not in the business of doing that because they could easily hire a property manager and do it, right? It's not that tough. Um, the reason they don't want that is because the CFO <laughs> is looking at non-performing assets. Those are assets that are on the bank's books that are not earning them anything, right? They're non-performing. So typically those properties, there's no tenant or anything in them. They have taken them over. They have the mortgage on it. The mortgage is not being paid. So they're not earning interest on that mortgage, right? And they're also not earning any income. So that reflects negatively on the bank's financials. So when the bank's investors look at the bank's financials, okay, and they see significant non-performing assets, they're going to question that CFO and that CEO and every other executive in, in the bank or credit union as to why do they have so many perform, non-performing assets and what's their plan or strategy uh, to exit those. Those become great opportunities for investors. Um, so if you're, even if you're starting out, um, working with bank owned you know, properties uh, can be a, a great place to start. Keep in mind that many of the banks, um, you know, a lot of their REOs, their bank owned properties, uh, tend to be um, a little bit higher dollar in some cases, okay? So they tend to be in, you know, like here in Memphis, you might find a lot of REOs that are in Cordova or maybe um, like say, uh, you know, Southwind, or Germantown, or maybe even Collierville. So just know that those will be a little bit higher dollar, um, you know, properties. But nonetheless, as you look across many banks, there, there are many opportunities um, to get uh, bank owned homes. Now, some people enjoy you know, foreclosures and pre-foreclosures. Um, some people like the auction. Um, for me, like I mentioned earlier, I love working with um, tired landlords. Um, and I also work like working and helping um, 
you know, uh, senior homeowners, so people that have owned their home for uh, a, a number of years and, and maybe are struggling to, uh, to find tenants or they're tired of managing tenants. So that's a lot of, of what I work with. Um, you know, I don't do a lot of, you know, I don't have any we buy houses signs all over town. That's not my thing. Um, I'm not doing a ton of like skip tracing lists. You know, I've had people ask me about that. I've done that stuff and spent a lot of money doing it. Um, but you know, I've also spent a lot, Cedric knows this because, you know, he's been, you know, on the phone with me, you know, when getting cussed out by folks, getting, you know, uh, phone calls and things like that. And so, um, you know, that's not something I want to get into a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, yeah, so you get into some of that for sure, Cedric. And so that's not really my play. I work a lot with um, actually real estate agents, which this is um, not as conventional, right? Because from a wholesaling standpoint, many wholesalers and real estate agents sometimes can be at odds. Um, what I found is that, again, in working in transparency and you know, remember trust, confidence, transparency, uh, I've been able to work with more investor, you know, friendly or focused, if you want to call it, um, you know, people that understand, you know, investing and understand, you know, the exit strategy of what we're trying to do. And that has been a great, great resource. So I encourage you, um, if you're starting out, and I'm going to go through here shortly of, you know, how to, to find properties that, you know, for opportunities and that sort of thing. One way to do that is with real estate agents. Um, they can be uh, a tremendous, um, you know, asset for you uh, in your network. Um, that 16 property uh, portfolio that I mentioned earlier, yes, came from an agent, came from a real estate agent who um, got paid handsomely as I did. And, um, you know, but we were able to solve uh, a major problem for the buyer and for uh, the seller. And so, you know, just keep that in mind because many investors try to, you know, you, you typically like to stay with properties that are not on, um, you know, the, the market. They're not listed to sell on the MLS. Okay. So typically investors like to work with off market property. Um, this particular, that portfolio deal was off market, but the real estate agent um, was able to connect with the owner and uh, was able to connect uh, then me in with that mix and we were able to provide uh, that option. That, and so why was the owner motivated to do that? Um, in that case, uh, you know, his primary motivation was not paying you know, a real estate uh, agent commission per se, although that's ultimately what he did. <laughs> um, but um, initially that was his motivation, but you know, working with the agent, we had to showcase the value that we all brought uh, to the table. And, uh, you know, that value was prevalent and, and able to help us get the deal done. Okay. All right. So, yeah, you know, we're, we're coming kind of quickly to the end, although I want to show some of the tools that, uh, that I use personally uh, to get involved in, um, in investing. But, you know, the biggest thing, you know, guys is you, know, you got to get started, right. You can go back to your motivation. You know, it, it's, you're not going to be perfect. Um, as, as someone that was even in banking and I was always you know, working on the retail sales side or business banking or commercial banking, you, you, you've got to be willing to, to get started, right? And you're going to mess it up, right? If, so for someone who hasn't started yet, yes, you're going to mess it up and that's going to be a good learning period. Um, but that's going to be in whatever you get involved in, right? Whatever you know, endeavor that, again, that you undertake um, in order to become good at, you have to start, right? And so I encourage you all to get started. So as you're looking at 2021, don't wait till January 1st and just think it's magically just gonna start. Oh, we're, we're here now, you know, start today. Go ahead and start, um, you know, looking at some of the tools I'm about to show you. Um, go ahead and start, you know, thinking about your mindset and what you wanna accomplish, okay? So, so did you have anything to add to that? We, we all make mistakes, so nobody's perfect, we're human. But the key is, is trying to make your mistakes early. You know, like when I started wholesaling, right, I didn't know a lot about wholesaling. I, to be very honest, I took it so wrong. I learned a lot of this by trial and error. I, did, I learned a lot of this from YouTube videos, hours and hours and hours, and, and, making, and, and talking to other wholesalers and just learning from, from other people, right? Um, and 
So it just shows you guys, you know, fear is the biggest thing I'll hold you back. You know, and I have a lot of friends, like Ron said, that, that, that come to me and say, hey, do you want to buy our first rental? But what happens if the renter doesn't pay me? Or what happens if the market crashes? I say, guys, there's a lot of things that can go wrong, but you know what? you got to take a chance. No risk, no reward. But think of, way out the risk versus reward. If the rewards are, you can make more money to the to best back and forth on some problems. And what's your why? If my why is my children, now it's tied back to your goal. Your goal is to create generational wealth. If that's, if that's your why, it ties all back. So you will, well, your, your risk and reward. There's a lot of people that are afraid to make the jump. And, they, you know, they're sitting on the sidelines for years. I have friends that have been sitting for five years now. They haven't bought their first home yet. Why? They're nervous. And mm-hmm. so everybody works their own pace. But, you know, put your tool in. Maybe start wholesaling first, right? Build up the build up the uh, cash flow, right? And then that net saving money, you now they could buy your first property. Yeah. That's one way to do it. Yeah, absolutely, Seth. I, and that's one point that I was going to reiterate was wholesaling is a great way to start. Um as is uh, you know, becoming a, a licensed realtor. Um, so you know, either one of those are great ways to, to get started. Um, you know, certainly in real estate, you know, um, you're gonna learn a ton. Um, you know, wholesaling is a great way, you know, even before you get your license. So if you're sitting today and you don't have a real estate license, with the exception of the state of Illinois and the state of Oklahoma, um, and then in, in Philadelphia right now, you know, you know, next month, they're going to require everyone to, to have a license. But with the exception of those areas, um, wholesaling is, is legal then in the United States. And so you're able to, um, again, get a property you know, under contract uh, with the seller and then uh, assign that contract to a cash buyer. And uh, basically, you're, you become the, the middleman or middlewoman in that transaction and uh, you earn income that way. And like Cedric said, that's a great way for you to start. Um, and it's a great way for you to build, um, you know, kind of some transactional income to start that then you can use uh, to funnel in, in other ways that, that you'd like. Um, so, you know, the, the, the key to, to all of this in investing is you're typically finding distressed properties or and distressed owners, right? Owners that have been impacted by something, right? They, you know, some life event, uh, a divorce, um, uh, you know, in some cases, an illness. Um, you know, a loss of job, you know, an impact to income. Um, you know, there are all kinds of different things that impact people, right? So you want to understand, you know, that distress and how you can be a resource in helping them find a solution. So that's the biggest thing. The biggest thing is not just the money, right? The money's a byproduct of solving problems, right? So you want to be really good at listening um, and you want to be really good at helping to find solutions, right? and understand what your exit strategy is. And so um, I'll go through some of the tools here shortly uh, as far as you know, finding those distressed properties. I already mentioned about bank REOs, but there's some others. Um, I'm willing to pay a referral fee. So for those that wanna get involved, um, you know, I'll have my contact info up at the end. Um, I will be paying uh, referral fees for those that refer a property that ultimately um, Cedric and I buy and you know it, whether we wholesale it as an exit strategy or um, do one of the other exit strategies, uh, particularly a buy and hold, uh, we will pay you uh, $500 cash uh, for that referral upon a closing. So um, just definitely keep that in mind. I'd love to work with each and every one of you on that and, and kind of help you through your own goals uh, as far as getting involved with investing. So um, schedule a one-on-one with me. I'll have my number up here uh, shortly. Uh, many of you uh, are connected with me on social media. So um, if you want to work with me, um, schedule a one-on-one. I'd love to be able to do that. Um, and like I say, again, the big part piece is you know helping to solve problems. I, I can't say that enough. Um, you know, if you're, you're not out helping people you know, solve problems and getting paid for doing so, um, you know, what are you doing, <laughs> you know? Um, Cedric, anything to add? And to add that, Ron, I'm sorry, I was going to say to add to Ron's point, I can tell you, you know, we, him and I, we, you know, all the deals that we have on the go, not one of them has been easy. But the beauty of what we, what Ron and I bring to the table is we are solution, we're solution finders. There's an issue, there's a wall, we don't just, you know, sit behind the wall and be like, okay, we, we can't get this done. Because if that's the case, no deals would get done. But what we do is we look at how do we get to the finish line? 
that we put our brains together and we say, okay, here are some strategies. What can we do? What is the roadblock? And figure out how to get past that roadblock. And that's why it's always great to have somebody to talk to, whether it's your significant other, whether that's a, a friend that's a, you know that, that knows real estate, whether that's Ron, you want to reach out to him or myself. You know, we're always willing to give, give advice because I think, you know, running ideas and, and, and just collaborating opens up a lot of doors. So it's very, very important to figure out solutions. And the other part, you know, when Ron was talking about, about uh, bird dog, and we call bird dog in that finder's feet, you know, I'll give you an example for me. There's a wholesaler that, you know, he's up in Mississippi, and uh, we met, you know, many, many months ago. And um, he's constantly, you know, I've been sending deals to him. He's, he's been... We've been close on a couple of deals, and finally, you know, we had one close uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, you know, that one, you know, we both made some good money on it. Now, what's funny is that same buyer, because he introduced me to him, and this is this is something just to make sure you guys know, you know, there's loyalty here from Ron and I. We're not gonna, we, we don't want to just do this for you know a couple months, make a lot of money, and leave. This is a long term. This is a way of life for us, right? Real estate's getting ingrained in, into us, so. This, this wholesale gave me passing this deal. He brought me that buyer. Two weeks later, I closed another deal through that buyer. This wholesale wasn't involved with that buyer, but because he introduced that buyer, he made himself $1,000. Now, every deal is different, but it just shows you the power of just finding finding buyers, finding deals. You'll get compensated for it. So it's very, very important to know that. If, you know, everybody has a piece of the puzzle. Everything connects. There's no line, there's no line and I without sellers and no run out of buyers. We have everything worked together. And yeah. those are very important and realtors are very important. So that's why it's very, very important to be be in touch with everybody. Right. You need to be able to have those connections and build those relationships and and, and maintain those relationships. Yeah. Right. Very, very important. The one thing I will tell you is relationships are if not for me, number one. Yes. Absolutely. And and you know, you're definitely an example through getting to know you, Cedric, and you know, that sort of thing. And, and and let me touch on something, you know, very quickly when it comes to relationships. You know, one of the things, you know, and those of you that, uh, you know, have successful businesses, and there are a few of you that are uh, here as participants that do, um, you know that you don't do it by yourself, right? You know, I see, uh, you know, my girl Andrea on here, you know, with Bubble Bistro. Shout out to her. Hopefully you got your orders in. Um, Y'all can't smell me through this virtual, but I'm smelling pretty good from that Bubble Bistro. <laughs> But Andrew will tell you that, so I'm sure that, you know, she, she doesn't run that operation by herself, right? Um, many of you, again, that you know, have uh, businesses, uh, you know, I'm going through, um, you know, Crystal DeBerry Masori, what's up, girl? You know, Derek, you know, many of you um, that I'm, I'm very familiar, uh, you know, Sherika, y'all, you're not doing that by yourself, right, Quan? You know, business is done um, as a collaborative effort. And so, um, and you've got to be able to highlight your strengths, and then you have to have people that um, help kind of manage, you know, where you're weak. And so Cedric and I, as an example, um, he's very good at um, managing those buyer relationships. He holds that very dear. Um, he works very well with, with buyers. He understands them. He understands their motivation. Um, he understands how to position deals to them. All right. Um, you know, not to say that I'm not good at that as well, but I'm better at kind of analyzing the deal. I'm good at um, understanding the values, uh, understanding where the math works, and then understanding the motivation of the seller. All right. So it works very well because I'm able to position deals with Cedric um, and we have a nice pipeline uh, as a result. And so, yeah, you know, as, as I share with you, you know, don't think that you're going to get into real estate investing and just become, you know, this kingpin, you know, by yourself. Um, you have to be willing to, to work with others and build up that network. And so if you do that, I think, um, you know, all of you that uh, take action will find great, uh, great success. Um, someone had asked earlier in the chat about, again, about REOs. And so, yes, our, for most banks, you can now find those uh, publicly. Uh, if you just Google, for example, if you Google Regions Bank REOs or uh, bank-owned property, um, it'll direct you pretty much right to that site. I think you can actually go to Regions Bank's uh, website and you can uh, actually find it uh, you know, pretty quickly. Matter of fact, let me do this. I'm gonna stop sharing uh, this right now. And I'm going to, I'm gonna actually pull that up and see if, if I can make that work. Um, let's see.
All right. So if y'all can see, uh, I've got Regions Bank website pulled up. So if y'all can see that, type in the chat and uh, let me know that y'all can see this. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. So uh, a couple things here. So if you go to, let's see, where is there? They should, yeah. So if you search here, right, you go to their search and you search um, uh, properties. All right. So when you search properties here, do you see right here, uh, regions properties for sale, homes for sale? All right. This is their, um, their bank owned property. All right, so some of the major banks, uh, you'll see this. All right, so you've got um, regions properties for sale. Um, let's see, and you wanna search for those. All right, so now you've got some search criteria you wanna do here. So if you wanna see, say all of them just in Tennessee, all right, all single family, if that's what you wanna look for, um, then you just set that up in your search criteria. You just click your find your property and here you go. All right. So that's how you can find in you know, many of the banks. You can do that by just going to their website. Now we're just searching them out on Google. Um, you can go and, and do that. So hope that makes sense for everybody. But that's just an, an easy, simple way to, uh, you know, to find, uh, you know, some of the bank owned REOs. Of course, you can always work uh, with real estate agents uh, as well uh, to find those. It's also another great um, opportunity there. So, all right. So let's uh, let me go back. I'll show you something else real quick. So, um, we often get asked about receipts, right? So let me do this. I'm gonna log in. Let's see. All right, so this is a checking account that I've got at Regions for the business, right? I had to get me a new one. And so you can see here, now I opened this at in early November, or I'm sorry, December. And this is the uh, dollar amount here from uh, the wire uh, on last week, okay? So you can see that uh, that's from the 16 property deal. So I'm starting to funnel um, some deals through my LLC, which is uh, Legacy Living Real Estate LLC. Uh, I'm gonna start routing to this account, okay? Um, so, Again, the money is a, a byproduct of being able to help solve the problem. So one of the things that I'm proud of is that being able to sell, solve that problem for the buyer and seller and then make money uh, as a result of that. OK, so you can see, of course, you know, with having the family and everything, everything's got to go back out the other way. <laughs> but nonetheless, I was able to, to do that. And so I got more in the pipeline, as uh, Cedric and I have mentioned. Uh, on the way. So it's a, uh, you know, again, it's a, it's a great business to get into. Uh, you can do a lot of it virtually, um, particularly when it comes to, to wholesaling. Um, but, you know, now's the time, y'all. Now is a, is a great time to, uh, to really get involved um, into real estate investing. All right. Um, let me share some of the tools that I use. So, you know, how do I get the data? Um, of course, you know, yeah, for those of you that are very familiar, of course, Zillow is a, a great tool, right? Um, let's just pull up a property here. So we'll search a property. Um, yeah, you know, just here on Zillow, you know, everybody's got access to this. So this is a, obviously a, a lot of uh, fairly solid information. Um, this Zillow, this estimate is, you know, don't get, you know, it, it's a nice guide. It's, it's not 100% accurate when you're talking about the, the value of a property. Um, but, um, you know, it's good to get some basic information. Uh, one of the things, so kind of a quick hack for using Zillow is, um, let me close that out. 
So if you want to look, let's just say you're looking in Memphis, right? Uh, let's see. So you're looking in Memphis. And you're looking at what's for sale. All right, once that comes up. All right, so in Memphis, let's just say you want to look at um, another good uh, area that's um, great for connecting for opportunities looking at for sale by owners, right? So let's just say you want to look at for sale by owners. Um, now, one of the things that you know you can do is when you go here to more, if you're on Zillow, and you can type in your keywords, um, think about from an investor standpoint, what you're, depending on your exit strategy and what you're looking to do, um, you're, you're looking for distress, right? So you may want to look you know, for keywords that are in the description of a property that signify distress, right? It could be uh, TLC. It could be uh, you know investor, could be you know cash, whatever it is. So let's just say you um, we'll just do cash, right? So it's going to search in that description on the property for the word cash, which is typically going to open things up for um, opportunities uh, you know to invest or you know certainly in a wholesale situation. All right. So let's let's see. All right, so of course you can save your search and you know, if you wanna get it daily or, or instantly, you know, I, I always prefer instantly when it comes up. Um, all right, so now you can go through and you can look at your different properties. You can look at a list, that sort of thing. Um, you know, however you wanna do that. So I think I might've messed something up because I, I had this stuff already saved, so, but, uh, Let's see. All right, let's get over that. Of course, you can add some more criteria in here if you want to do your price or uh, number of beds, that sort of thing. Um, let's get that out of the way. I'm sure, I know this thing. Get my age in this thing, but. So yeah, so here's, you know, when you're looking at some of these, you know, look at how long they've been, um, you know, on the market or, or at least posted on Zillow that can give you, again, another opportunity for motivation, right? Uh, motivated seller. So that's what you want to do. And then you want to reach out directly to the seller um, if you can, or like I prefer to do um, is work with an agent. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, uh, you said that before. So Working with an agent definitely can help. It can help vet out motivation um, and it can help uh, progress a deal uh, you know, a little bit quicker. So someone asked, let's see, are there any different steps during the buying process for you to purchase through your LLC? Um, no, there's no different uh, you know, steps as far as purchasing through an LLC. Um, you just set it up. Of course, you can go to, uh, I believe it's tnbear.com. Is it .com or .gov? No, tnbear.gov, I think. Um, you can go in and you can um, you can pull up, you know, how to you know set up your LLC if you're in Tennessee. Um, and of course, whatever state that you're in, um, you pull up that state's uh, you know basically business registration and business services uh, page, and uh, you can set up your LLC, or you can utilize an attorney um, if you'd like to do it that way as well. Um, but, you know, there's no different, um, you know, tab. The only thing that you do is when I do a contract, um, of course, I'm doing everything in my LLC's name. And then uh, any uh, monies or anything like that is deposited into an LLC uh, checking account or, or whatever account you have set up at, at a bank or financial institution. Let's see, Pearl asks, uh, can nonprofits purchase property? Yes, absolutely. Of course you can. Um, you know, um, there are many nonprofits that, you know, um, go around and, you know, uh, purchase property. Of course, you know, you're all familiar with Habitat for Humanity. Um, St. Jude owns all kinds of property. Many nonprofits own the property that they're located at, as well as other properties uh, around their community. Uh, many of the CDCs own property. And so, yeah, you're able to purchase and, and buy property uh, as a nonprofit as well. 
All right. Um, one other tool other than Zillow. So Zillow is a free tool that you can utilize. Um, if you have a little bit of a budget and um, you know, want to get involved in maybe a little bit higher uh, level of data, um, there are many options out there. One that I really like is PropStream, okay? Um, so uh, PropStream is just PropStream.com. Uh, PropStream is $99 a month. Um, so we're, I'm gonna log in here and I'm gonna show you kind of the difference between real quick PropStream and Zillow, okay? So PropStream is pulling data from public record, okay? So once we get logged in here, they always give you um, kind of the software updates, which is really cool because they let you know kind of what they've added new, new features, that sort of thing. So I really like that. All right, so what you got when you go into PropStream is, of course, it finds you here on the map. Um, there's so many different ways to filter, and I could probably do a whole webinar <laughs> just on PropStream. But um, one of the things that you could do is you could search a property. So let's pull up one here. Um, we're going to pull up uh, this one here, uh, 2737 Pfizer Road. All right. And of course, what you see here is um, it pulls it up. It pulls up listings that have been nearby, that sort of thing. Um, all kinds of data on the zip code. Um, you've got, we talked earlier about, uh, you know, finding like uh, bank REOs or bank owned properties if you're looking for cash buyers. Um, another one I didn't mention earlier um, is uh, failed listings. Um, so this is another great way to work with your, um, with your agent is on failed listings. You know, what is a failed listing? Um, a failed listing is a property that was listed by a real estate agent, a licensed real estate agent. Um, that for some reason it failed. It did not sell. The property did not sell. But, you know, so why is that? Why did the property not sell? Well, um, there are a number of different reasons, but one of them could have been that um, either it wasn't maybe marketed properly. properly. Um, the owner or the seller did not want to do any rehab. And so um, maybe there was some other issue um, with the property or the way it was marketed that resulted in the, the listing becoming failed. Um, those become great opportunities because the motivation is there. They listed the property, but uh, for whatever reason, it, it, it failed. Um, of course, you'll want to dig into the, the data behind that because um, a failed listing could be a sign of maybe some, some troubles with the property. Uh, but oftentimes, the distress is an opportunity uh, for you to come in, um, whether you, you, know, you want to be able to do a buy and hold or you want to do a fix and flip, whatever it is that you want to do as an exit strategy or wholesale, um, this creates an opportunity. So um, I go through the details. And what you've got here is just, uh, just a ton of, of kind of public uh, data information that becomes very helpful. Um, you know, so PropStream gives you, you know, here in this left hand box or in the top left. Um, it gives you a lot of information that's really just good, basic on the property that you'd find just about anywhere, okay? Number of bedrooms, square footage, lot size, you know, blah, blah, blah. Whether it's on or off market, whether it has a, a homeowners association tied to it, um, it pulls uh, uh, post office data on whether the property is occupied or not, um, how it was purchased by the seller, whether it's by financing or cash. You know who the owner is, their mailing, you know their mailing address, um, just a lot of you know uh, information here. Okay, um, it, it gives you a, an estimated value. So kind of like Zillow, you don't want to use that as the as gospel, um, but it gives you kind of a good guide. Um, you know there within the software, um, it'll tell you. So with this property uh, here at Pfizer Road, uh, this individual uh, looks like a uh, Fabrenzo Green. Don't know if y'all related to Fabrenzo, but um, this property was purchased for $5,000 back in 2018. So a little over two years ago, this property was uh, was purchased um, by, him, by this individual. And it was a failed listing. Uh, so it was on the, uh, the MLS. Uh, it was listed at $42,000. Um, and so then it failed. And so this gives information, it tells you who the agent was, um, and it even gives the listing history. So 
with PropStream, you have access to the MLS, which is typically reserved for a licensed real estate agent. Um, but now the, the public is able to have access to that MLS uh, through PropStream. So that, again, it's another great value. And so this gives you the listing history um, of the property. Looks like it was initially listed back in 2019 and it's gone uh, all the way down, okay? Um, another value that PropStream gives is being able to see MLS comp. So it doesn't just give you access to the MLS in terms of what's listed, but also to the comps, which is great for finding your value, okay? Um, I typically look at uh, MLS comps. Um, when I'm looking, I like to look, this is just my personal preference. I like to look at anything that has sold since the pandemic hit, <laughs> right? So it's pretty obvious why I wanna do that. Um, the reason I wanna do that is, you know, people that are active during the pandemic, right? With everything going on, um, those people are, you know, they're active, right? They're doing stuff, right? They're buying. And so those are people and those are sales that you want to really give uh, credence to, okay? So you can see, I, I typically look within a half mile of the property. You try not to cross major streets, okay? So if you're looking at this, um, this street that I'm dragging the cursor along, that is Lamar, all right? So you got Bethel Grove and you've got the Mecca here, Orange Mound. All right, so this property is located um, just south of Barron Avenue. All right, and you can see the different, um, you know, uh, properties that have sold. Okay, so what you want to do uh, as you're looking at your comps is you want to narrow it down to similar size. I'm not going to go through it now, but you want, you know, so this is 994 square feet. So you want to look at properties that are kind of within that range, similar number of uh, beds and baths and a similar year built. You know, you don't want to, you know, compare properties that are 50 years, you know, different, you know, in terms of when they were, uh, uh, you know, built. You don't want to compare those to each other because they, they're completely different properties. And so what you want to do is, you know, prop stream as you uh, change the properties that you select. So if I just go in and I select uh, one, two, and three, you can see up here that the average price um, cost per square foot and days on the market all changes, y'all, um, as I add or take away uh, properties that have been sold. And so this is a powerful tool to use when making offers and understanding, um, you know, the, the true value of a property, okay? Um, and that ARV that I mentioned earlier, this is a great way to help get a guide towards, you know, what that is. Um, another great value that PropStream gives you is link properties, okay? And so this is property. So um, this owner for Brizo Green also own, uh, owns a total of eight properties. And you can see uh, the value of his portfolio and you can see his primary residence property uh, there in Texas. And then you can see what he owns. Uh, he owns some stuff in Mississippi and Texas and uh, the one property here in Memphis. And then he's got one in Oklahoma. Okay, so you, you, no, Cedric, please do. Yes. Yeah. Hey, uh, uh, so how Ron and I, like, actually, how Ron and I work, and this is something I also show with you guys. When I started wholesaling, right, I just use you all, to be very honest with you, right? A lot of times people think, oh, you got to invest a ton of money to start. No, I started with Zelo, and actually, a lot of times, even with the ARV, uh, Ron's a king of the ARV. He's able to really analyze deals, you know. Where my strength is on the buyer's side, you know, Ron's really good at just looking at the deals, understanding what, you know, what rehab needed. He has a good calculator that I actually use all the, all the time now. So it's a really good one, one of the best I've seen. And, um, you know, we'll see a property and I'll say, hey, Ron, it'll be two in the morning. I kid you not, I think of Christmas Eve where I was on my laptop at 3 a.m. It's two, he's a central time, 2 a.m. this time. And we're emailing back with all the more properties. So um, it's really important yeah. to share, you know, this, you get, get somebody else's perspective. You might see something like, hey, the ARV might be 30K, um, but here, let me send it to somebody else and see what they think. I always going to get that second opinion. So, um, yeah, back to you, Ryan. I just want to share that, kind of, kind of how, we, how we work together with, uh, with ARVs and analyzing properties. Yeah, absolutely. No, thanks for that, Cedric. And like I said, I don't want to get too deep into this. Um, you know, you could get mortgage data on here so you can see, you know, what was used to, to purchase a property. 
I mean, tax information. I mean, you know, PropStream probably has even more data than you might even need. Um, you can do a deal analysis. You can print this. Um, you can tag it, um, create all kinds of lists. Um, as you can see uh, over here under my properties, I've got um, several properties list. One of the things that um, PropStream helps me do is sort, um, you know, properties, you know, often by how I source them or how I find them or who I speak with. So you can see here, I've got you know, properties that have been, you know, uh, that Cedric and I have worked on. Um, you can see I have those uh, designated as a, a list under Cedric's name um, where I could easily uh, go back and find those properties and um, be able to, to work those and get the data. Um, PropStream also has marketing tools, allows you to do some skip tracing. I do not use the skip tracing in PropStream. There are better sources, in my opinion, to do that. Um, I'm happy to share those with you, um, those other sources for getting uh, information. Um, and then you can do uh, some campaigns. So you can send out uh, mailers right here for PropStream. You don't have to go to another site. Um, so if you wanna send a postcard or a mailer uh, to, uh, to someone, to an owner, you can do that. Um, and you can also uh, set up a voice message. So if you want to um, you know, do what's called an RVM or a ringless voicemail, which uh, that's the cell phone system allows you to send a voicemail to someone's phone uh, without it actually dialing them. Um, a lot of people use that as a tool. And so you can do that right here out of the software. So, um, you know, there's additional costs to skip trace and to send the voice message. Like I say, the basic cost of the software um, uh, is $99 a month. And so, like Cedric said, you know, I, you know, he and I, you know, we're, we're similar in a lot of ways. One way we're similar is we try to look at how can we get the best bang for our buck, right? And so how can you get the data that you need to make deals, especially when you're first starting out? So I'm a big proponent, y'all, uh, and those that know me know this, um, you know, you, you use the tools that you have and then you build up. So as you're able to do a deal, you can start picking up some of these tools like PropStream if you don't necessarily have the budget or feel comfortable um, putting, you know, $100 a month uh, out right out the gate. Um, no, use Zillow, use some of the other tools, but then consider PropStream. Um, it allows for a seven day uh, trial. So you can use it seven days for free um, before you have to commit. So you get a chance to kind of play around with it. So if you're interested in that, I can definitely, um, you know, send you the link there for sure, okay? So that's just PropStream, y'all, to give you a, a sense of some of the tools. Um, real quick, I want to show, because someone asked about, and Cedric mentioned this, about the, um, the calculator that I use, okay? Um, so here, if everybody can see this, this is a calculator that I developed, so this is uh, proprietary. <laughs> um, I am happy to share this out with all of you. So after this uh, webinar, um, you all will receive this uh, shortly in an email. Um, this is a calculator that I use to analyze deals. So um, I've got some verbiage here just as reminders and, and to help those that are new just with some definitions over here to your right. Um, so that's just to help you out, um, you know, especially if you're new or just need a reminder. But I've used this calculator to determine, um, you know, whether I'm, I'm buying and holding myself or as if I'm wholesaling a deal. Um, to determine what my offer will be to the owner or the seller, and then what my sales price is going to be to the buyer. All right. So this, you know, makes it very quick. So I've got an example in here, but um, let's, you know, we can always change this up. Okay. So let's just say our um, ARVR after repair value is 150000 Okay. Okay. Um, when, you, when you say what your percentage of ARV is, um, you're typically going to buy anywhere from, you know, uh, 50, maybe 60% of that value. So let's just say um, we're at 50% of it. All right. You take the square footage of the property. So let's just say it's 1,200 square feet. All right. So you notice everywhere where it's got an auto calculation, it's already calculating the, the number data for you. You don't have to input everything into every slot here. Um, just the ones here that are basically in green, all right? So when I change the uh, square footage, um, it's got a uh, estimated repairs. I've got that set at set, well, actually it should be, 
uh, $8. So let me change that real quick. I play around with this sometimes. And so, um, so up here, you can see in my formula, I've got it at $8 uh, per square foot. Um, in future uh, workshops and webinars, or even when we talk one-on-one, -on -one, I will share um, you know, what goes into how I calculate repairs in terms of that dollar. $8 a square foot is pretty much kind of a, a fairly close standard for something just cosmetic. If you're just painting, repairing floors, that sort of thing. So nothing hardcore. So you know, at 1,200 square feet and $8 per square foot, that's calculating the estimated repairs at $9,600. If you're, you're wanting to earn a $5,000 wholesale fee, okay, um, then your max offer to the owner would be $65,400. That's not necessarily where you want to start, of course. That's just where your max is if you're buying at 50% value. Um, and then when you add in the wholesale fee, it's giving you your minimum sales price to your buyer. All right. So you want to get it under contract at $65,000 roughly or less. And then you want to sell it or you know, that contract, assign that contract to your in buyer, your cash buyer um, at a minimum of 70,000. Right. And that's where you in between are going to make the 5,000. Okay. What I've got down here is this is for your in buyer, right? So you understand where your in buyer is going to be. Your in buyer typically wants to be at 70% of that value uh, or, uh, or less, right? So um, when you add back in your rehab, that 9,600, all right, um, your buyer is going to be in at 80,000 after they purchase it from you and they rehab it. Um, if that you know estimate holds true, uh, at eighty thousand, so then their uh, ARV would be fifty three thousand. So what I do is, you know, I I play with these numbers, right? So let's just say if you bought at a higher percentage of value, because you've got some wiggle room here, because remember your your buyer is willing to get up to seventy thousand. You want to leave some wiggle room in here, and you say, you might say, well, Ron, why is that? Because this uh, rehab, this estimated repairs, this is a, a estimate, right? Um, for many that are savvy and that have been in investing for some time, uh, we all know that uh, you know, oftentimes you know, what you estimate on repairs um, may not be completely true. And, and sometimes you have to adjust this once you may see a property or get pictures of it. Because um, you may think, okay, it's only a cosmetic rehab, but then it could end up being a full rehab where you've got to go through and um, you know, take down walls and rebuild kitchens and that sort of thing. And that can change um, your, your estimated repairs. So let's just say you go to a property, you go in your uh, uh, formula up here, and let's just say it's $15 a foot because it's, uh, you know, it's more of a complete you know, kind of gut rehab, maybe even $20 a foot. So now that's changing, you know, your numbers here. Okay. So you know this calculator is good to kind of play with. It's it's very simple, um, but you you all will be receiving this um, as participating in uh, uh, in this webinar. So let's just see. I'm gonna read from the chat. So hey, Christy Anderson, thank you so much for joining. I see I emailed you about the registration being closed. So you know I have my contact info at the end of the meeting. Will I still be allowed to receive? Yes, absolutely. So. Yeah, I got your email, Christy. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate your email from earlier. Um, that was really cool. So I'm glad you're able to join in. And yes, you will receive that. So I've got your email address. And uh, we emailed earlier, I think. So yeah, you will receive this. So no, thank you. Let's see. Um, any questions? Um, you know, any additional thoughts? Uh, Cedric, did you have anything you wanted to add? Cedric might have had to step away, um, keeping him for a while. And he's got a young one there, by the way, too. He's got a, a, a really young kid uh, there at the house. So, yeah, yeah sorry about that, guys. Yeah, no, I have, the, I have a little one here, and I got, I got my, uh, you guys for I got my five month old, and then I got my, uh, it's going to be three next month. So, so <laughs> this is a teach you guys. If I can do it with a full time job and, you know, managing the, the, my portfolio, 
and you know two young kids you know uh, there's no excuses i'm not just saying that there's you know i know others that have three kids they're doing it right so um just you know just putting that perspective that that time the time that i usually have is in the evening when they're sleeping is when i'm on there looking for properties and when i'm up there you know talking around and, and, and see if we can get deals done so um you know and yes there's going to be distractions but don't make that a reason uh, to not not do it and not uh and not move forward and, and, and analyze deals or even, you know, bird dogs. So just, you know, from my perspective, you know, it's a fall walk run. Start with the crawling phase, right? Crawling phase, maybe it's just folks with Tom with Ron, next with me, and Ron's going to share my email. If you guys have any questions, I'm always willing to give my expertise and give my knowledge. I don't know everything, but I can share what I do know and what to work for me, and hopefully it'll work for you. Right? At the end of the day, we want to see everybody successful. Yeah. That's kind of how I look at That's how I look at life. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Cedric, that's a great way to sum that up, man. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to give a, a quick second um, if there are any additional uh, questions. Um, you know, we, like I said, we can always follow up. Um, yeah, you've got my information there. Definitely uh, shoot me over a text. Um, but I really appreciate you guys hanging in there with us, um, getting this information. And uh, let's see, I'm just going to check and see. Uh, Let's see, Kim, thank you. There's a uh, business information. Okay. Uh, call in on the Zoom dial. Yeah, it was a little difficult on the um, Zoom dial, Kim, for getting Cedric in, um, mainly from the, the Canada, Canadian connection. <laughs> uh, but that's something that we'll work on uh, definitely in the future. So, Kim, I appreciate that feedback. That's, uh, re that's really good. I know you guys want to see Cedric's pretty face, too, so. But yeah, so definitely we'll get that. Um, so if no other questions or anything, listen, thank y'all so much again. I really appreciate it. I kept you uh, a little longer than I, uh, I planned to, but uh, we want to make sure we get the information in. So connect with me and uh, let's do it. And I wish you all, uh, again, uh, happy holidays to you and your families. Um, and you know, let's get it for 2021. You know, there's not gonna be any time you know, for you to wait. Um, you know, now's the time. So thank y'all so much. What's up, Quan? Appreciate it. Go mob. Uh, Fred brother right there. So thank y'all so much and uh, go be great. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for having me. And thank you guys. I'm here, Ron and I are here to help. So again, thank you guys for everything. Right. No doubt. Appreciate it, Cedric. Y'all be great, man. Okay, Ron. Okay, take care.